Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. From a young age and learning from his humble and hardworking parents who immigrated from South Korea, Paul Kim developed an appreciation for the value of capitalism and the pursuit of the American dream. Finding his way into the finance industry, first in an investment banking seat at Lazard, where he learned by fire, Paul would ultimately spend time at PIMCO and then at Principal Global Investors, where he launched and built the firm's ETF business. More recently, Paul co-founded Simplify Asset Management, a firm committed to delivering innovative products in the exchange-traded landscape. Our conversation is focused on how derivatives can be used within an ETF to augment the purely linear exposures provided by traditional instruments like the SPY. By overlaying a put option, for instance, an investor can protect against extreme downside risk and equities like that which materialized in March of 2020. We discuss as well important and exciting new developments in the ETF industry, one of which allows for the utilization of OTC derivatives. In this context, Simplify has created a groundbreaking product that seeks to hedge interest rate risk for end users, work developed by derivatives pioneer Harley Bassman. In an environment in which fiscal and monetary policy are acting powerfully in tandem, such a product can easily prove critical to defending the potential inflation that may already be surfacing. Lastly, Paul and I touch on the fast-moving world of cryptocurrencies and how his firm is thinking about giving investors access to this new asset class and the potentially diversifying role it may serve in a portfolio. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Paul Kim. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Paul Kim. He is the founder and CEO of Simplify Asset Management, a firm that's in the ETF landscape. Paul, thank you for joining us and being a guest today on the Alpha Exchange. Thanks, Dean. I'm really excited for this conversation. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. We've got a lot to go through here, a lot to talk about. Let's start from the beginning and with you telling us about your start in the world of high finance. How did you get involved in our industry? Sure. So let's rewind all the way back. I knew fairly early in high school that I'd wanted to do something in business slash finance, liars, poker, movie, Wall Street, et cetera. But really it goes back further. My family immigrated from South Korea when I was four and We sort of, as a family, kind of lived a classic American dream where my parents struggled and worked their way up from a fruit store in Queens and start to climb sort of the size of the stores and eventually became sort of an import-export business that employed hundreds of people, got their kids into really good schools. I was enrolled at Dartmouth, studied economics, but the whole context was seeing capitalism and hard work and sort of the values of immigrants, if you will, and the American dream paying off. So all of those are really, really foundational experiences. And I wanted to continue sort of that business trek, if you will, after college. So after studying econ, I graduated during the internet boom. So it really wasn't quite the thing at Dartmouth. I think we're far away from the West Coast. So I really hadn't heard of companies like Google and others that some of my friends joined around that time. But the classic road from Dartmouth, one of them was either consulting or banking or law school or pre-med, et cetera. I followed sort of the investment banking track. I ended up on Wall Street at Lazard in New York, learn by fire, basically finance boot camp. You go in, it's a very structured work environment. You get tasks and obviously you have to do everything from accounting to valuation, to learning about an industry, about a company very rudimentary sales and pitching and all of the things. So it was a very, very good experience and foundational there as well. And then after that, I sort of stumbled upon private equity, which was an interesting shift from the sell side, where I think there's much more of a transactional mindset to the buy side, where it becomes much more of a fiduciary role, one of sort of investing and acquiring a business or stock or whatever asset and helping or thinking about it from a builder slash grower perspective. So that was a good mindset and education. And then one more pit stop before business school and into the world of ETFs was at two digital marketing startups. This is sort of the 
days of the pop-up world where remember the annoying pop-ups that would show up when you go to a website. But that was really the early onset of targeted marketing. It wasn't a generic or random pop-up. The pop-ups started getting pretty good and they would know what website you were browsing or what content you're looking for. And so it was kind of a Wall Street type of job where we would, as a company, go buy up excess inventory and try to find a way to add value by properly targeting that excess inventory and trying to use data and unique algorithms and things like that. So it's a good, interesting extension of that sort of finance and business mindset. And then I went off to Wharton thinking I'd go back into the world of private equity or hedge funds. And in the summertime, I got an internship at PIMCO as a product manager, which I didn't even know was a possibility in asset management. This was the summer of 2008, and it was just before all of the rumblings of Lehman and all of these sort of big events between 08 and 09. It was an interesting experience. One of the projects I was tasked on was looking at ETFs. And by the time I graduated in 09, we, or PIMCO, had just launched our first ETF and was looking to expand. And so that was my first foray into ETFs. I didn't even know what ETFs were before really the summer of 2008. From that point on, I've been very, very deep into the ETF world. And this is now my third ETF platform at Simplify. Awesome. Wonderful. And I can imagine during your studies of economics at Dartmouth, you probably spent months and months on negative interest rates and meme (laughs) stock volatility, all that. (laughs) Yeah, basically throughout everything from a textbook perspective, and not just from Dartmouth, I mean, from Warren, much of that finance textbook knowledge has completely been turned upside down. And I think part of the sort of requirements now to be a successful investor is to understand what drives or what does not drive markets. And right now it's a liquidity game and central bank can starting to become more of a macro slash policy game. But ultimately, it feels like liquidity is the end all and be all of investing right now. Where did you find yourself during the first giant financial crisis in 2008? And if you can, what were some of the formative takeaways from that seismic event? So 2008, I was a summer intern at PIMCO watching the events and we're seeing Bill Gross, Paul McCulley, or Mohammed jump on CNBC now and then talking about which banks were under the Fed umbrella and which were not. So it was very interesting to see that. And really, it felt like very much front row seats on the conversations around that and the importance of, again, the Fed and policy as a driver of investing, of credit risk, and ultimately to the market structure we have today. So it was a really, really interesting experience on top of sort of the day-to-day work of building out a brand new ETF business at a very, very large asset management firm. So so interesting. I mean, as you mentioned, Bill Gross, the Bond King, and this tailwind of roughly 40 years of rates effectively coming down and down and down. And this idea that the price of the risk-free asset in some ways, just by virtue of the low rate is so high It's almost not risk-free because the price is so high and it just spills over into everything else. All these other assets are so high in price as well. And you might argue that the world needs more assets to buy just because the starting point of risk-free is just so unpalatable for folks. So let's get into ETFs. It's a product and I'd love just maybe for you to start just big picture, high level in terms of how we should think about this asset class. I mean, Ultimately, you had the mutual fund industry, you still have it. It's gigantic. But at least as someone who's not an expert, but knows a little bit about this stuff, it's the ETF product would seem pretty superior to the mutual fund product, at least from a liquidity standpoint. But tell us about a little bit about the ETF industry. We'll drill down into some of the advancements and what you guys are doing at Simplify, but tell us a little bit about the industry and maybe give us some of the key milestones in terms of development that brought us to this giant, I don't know, $8 trillion, is that about right, of assets under management? It keeps growing. It depends which countries and markets you add up. Okay. Uh, but look, it's a very, very important part of the investment world for sure. 
And I know you've had guests that describe it as a financial technology. And in some way it is, I think it's a vehicle. It's an investment vehicle. It's not an asset class per se, but it's a way to wrap investments and wrap it in a way that's accessible to just about everyone. Everyone from a Robin Hood user with a hundred bucks to invest as well as the largest endowments. And that's a really interesting thing to say because just like anyone can buy a share of a company, anyone can buy a share of an ETF, but inside that ETF is some very sophisticated exposures and leveraging. It's leveraging massive infrastructure investments and the access made available by very large successful firms as well as smaller firms like ourselves that are focused on niche exposures or other ways of competing in that space. But imagine before the advent of the ETF, how investors were able to access things like high yield or muni bonds. You would struggle to buy the bond itself, or you may have to pay a lot of money to go buy a very opaque and expensive mutual fund. And so the ETF basically allows any investor, again, the largest to smallest, to access the execution desk and the expertise and the relationships of a BlackRock, a PIMCO, or one of the large market makers. And so the execution and the ability to gather 500 or 1,000 bond portfolios in a single ticker, that's amazing. It's ultimately a democratization of investing and a leveling of the playing field. And then it goes beyond the leveling of a playing field and went into sort of tax efficient. The ETF wrapper, I think the biggest reason beyond just cost or passive sort of dominance recently is really the fact that it's a tax deferral vehicle. And so you have a way to sort of invest and compound investments in a broad range of asset classes while taking advantage of the in-kind redemption of the ETF vehicle. And that's a massive difference. It will add meaningfully to the return potential, not just from not having to pay expensive fees, but from the ability to defer taxes. That is powerful. And I think the other aspect of it, and I'd love for you to, again, just give us some of the milestones and the advances, but of course the ETF product started with something like the spiders, very basic, take the 500 stocks. And along the way, we've incorporated so many other risk exposures, asset classes. The product has got an increasing amount of flexibility underneath the hood. Let's talk, for example, about the TLT, the iShares 20-year bond ETF. And you were talking about it being a representation of financial technology. How does it come to be that the bond ETF is made available through an equity desk? What's the coordination that needs to happen there? What's the underlying technology effectively that's been solved for? Well, the main solving is really taking the sort of mutual fund type of commingled portfolio and being able to put it into a tradable security. So security is a partial ownership, one share of a much larger fund, but that share is valued intraday because some participant in the marketplace, like a market maker, a Jane Street or Virtua, somebody can take a look at that entire portfolio, price it live during the day and build in their appropriate bid ask spreads to earn an amount of money and be able to hedge it. And that whole sort of ecosystem of a portfolio, getting it up into an ETF and then putting it on exchange and having a live price generated and competed over by market makers, that certainly is coordination. And coordination as a sort of totality, I think, is technology. It's not just one patent somewhere, but it's a bunch of coordinated entities making this possible and really, really efficient. And so to make TLT work, it required all of that. But once you put it inside the ETF vehicle, now it creates the ability to innovate further. Now you could put it inside of a portfolio. You could put it inside of a risk analytics platforms, they can measure the duration of the portfolio and the yield of all these different positions and address specific investor needs and wants. And so on and on and on, the ETF as a building block or access point is only creating this ability to create a massive infrastructure and just better serve investors. And I think really it's come to become the basic building block slash component of the investment portfolio for most people 
certainly in the U.S. and increasingly across the world. Staying with that conversation on fixed income ETFs, and maybe the TLT is not the right example because underlying it, of course, is a very deep and liquid market in government securities. But there's always been a fair amount of conversation around a product like the HYG, where the risk transfer that seems to occur in the ETF itself, the massive amount of back and forth in terms of volume set against the relative and sometimes significant illiquidity of the underlying basket. There are some folks on one side of the argument that say this is potentially an accident waiting to happen. Others just don't feel the same way. Walk us through that in terms of an ETF for which the liquidity of the shares seems to outstrip, sometimes in large measure, the liquidity of the underlying assets. So there are a lot of network effects. So if someone had to value one bond in isolation and price in the appropriate discounts, you would reach a different number. But when you have enough participants who find value on either side of the trade, all of a sudden you have a much more efficient and real-time market-making machine. So the high-yield ETF now arguably is the market price setter because you have so many more liquid participants of all genres and size. And so it's providing both access, but at the same time, a pricing signal. And so it's become useful for a lot of different parts of the fixed income market. And it actually kind of allows the sort of transacting of that exposure without impacting or really negatively impacting the underlying bonds and and sort of creating friction. So it's interesting. It's kind of doing what the SEC arguably was looking for when they first approved the SPY ETF, almost a derivative-like liquidity source for the market that sort of helps almost lubricate that exposure and help spread around the liquidity. So I think net positive for everyone and that transformation isn't as big of a deal today than it was 10, 15 years ago. It seems like people are fairly comfortable. It's navigated several deep sell-offs and it's sort of proven itself, at least within those asset classes. I think the interesting part is now the niche becomes further and further out and you're getting into much more exotic exposures. And one of our ETFs is in the realm of OTC, but we're in interest rate derivatives where the pricing around that can be a lot more challenging on a sort of tick by tick basis, but it's still a very liquid market, one of the biggest markets in the world. And so there's trade-offs to everything. But I think ultimately, as long as market participants, especially the market makers, are able to price these and hedge against that exposure, it's a net additive. It's a benefit to be able to add ways to access markets, to build portfolios and to hedge risks. And I think the ETF continues to be that vehicle of choice. So it's exciting. You make a great point. And I think what we all need is price discovery. It's very critical. For better or for worse, we have to know where things are. And certainly in those very dark days of maybe mid-March of 2020, price discovery was certainly not something that we enjoyed, but it was real and you had to kind of know where things are. It's a great point. As we transition, and we'll have so much to talk about in terms of, as you alluded to, some of the innovations in the ETF space and specifically what you guys are doing on the OTC derivative front, we can't not address in our conversation the XIV blow up. As a derivative expert, I'd love to get your take. It's a couple of years ago now, but just I'd love to get your perspective on that event. What was on your mind in 2017 as vol just went lower and lower and lower? How that event maybe interacted with your business and the products that you're thinking about on behalf of your end users. Tell us about the XIV from your perspective. So from my perspective, while I was at Principal, it was a non-event because Principal does not have products that really touch volatility directly. But I think from the industry perspective, it was interesting. And certainly from my firm's perspective today, where we have sort of a improved version of XIV, if you will, where we have a short fall strategy. And then we have one of perhaps a two people, Chris Cole and Michael Green, were on the record pointing out the risks of XIV. Michael Green is now a colleague and a member of Simplify and a portfolio manager on that short vol strategy. So I think the punchline there is it's not about innovation or regulation. I think it's more about appropriate use of leverage 
which can strike in any vehicle and entity. And the argument there was you effectively had a 100% vol asset class and you were taking the inverse exposure to that. It was only a matter of time before that kind of volatility with an inverse levered ETF would run into trouble. And once the theoretical became the actual, you saw sort of the situation play out. But it's not just that exposure. It's any exposure where you have the inappropriate use of leverage or design that doesn't take into account the realm of possibilities. So wherever we can, although we are in this product selling vol, we tend to be on the other side. We tend to think about being long vol, being long convexity, or explicitly putting in hedges to protect from unknowable downside, getting rid of that sort of possibility. And I think that's important. I think that's a good lesson for the industry, even if it weren't directly impacting many asset managers. It's a good lesson on things like leverage, things like exposures that rely on liquidity, things like credit. If you have a run on the sort of fund and there are no bids, it starts to look a lot like the sort of unintended leverage, if you will. Well, as we transition to talking about what you guys are up to now at Simplify, help us understand just in terms of the usage of derivatives within ETFs, how we got to where we are now, what's been a key development from a regulatory standpoint. Give us a little timeline. That'd be helpful. Sure. So in 08, 09, when I joined PIMCO, we were celebrating the first active ETFs around that time frame. But key to that was also you weren't allowed to use derivatives inside the ETF vehicle. There was a moratorium on the use of derivatives. I remember no swaps, options, or futures. And PIMCO launched a total return strategy that did not have swaps, options, or futures. But fast forward about three years later, at the end of 2012, the SEC lifted the moratorium on derivatives. Now ETFs had a level playing field to other vehicles like the mutual fund. More recently, and more importantly for Simplify, And the reason that really that I wanted to start Simplify was the SEC modernized the use of derivatives through the derivatives rule, which basically took all registered investment companies from the sort of seg assets world, where very much limited the amount of derivatives and leverage to the VAR world, the value at risk world, where you could manage exposures as long as it falls into sort of testable scenarios much similar to the USITS framework and much similar to how hedge funds and sort of insurance products and things were thinking about risk. So downside and sort of the probability of losing a certain amount of money, that opens a lot more sort of rational use and thoughtful use of gross exposures, which is important because now all of a sudden it opens up the world of products and alternatives that are interesting for people. So a currency strategy that's unlevered and 100% gross exposure would be a very, very boring exposure for most. But if you can lever an exposure or take long short positions, all of a sudden it opens up certain asset classes to become meaningfully efficient and interesting for portfolio management. A very low vol and expensive use of balance sheet is not an efficient use of balance sheet. But if you lever up a low vol strategy up to something that makes it more interesting as a multi-asset allocation, it creates some good use cases. So that's sort of a context. When I think about derivatives and ETFs, I think there's a couple of ways to think about it. The first is a very basic substitute for cash securities. So you had that in Europe where you had synthetic exposures, or you have that where you use a future instead of an index exposure, on and on. That's basic. There are times when that makes sense for liquidity, operational, or legal, often tax reasons. So fine, that's basic and that's been done. That's not that controversial. The second is as a hedge or overlay, so as a way to limit risks. Think of FX overlays where you could strip out foreign exposure, foreign currency exposure, or where you could hedge out duration credit risk or put sense out of portfolio. So that's fairly straightforward, still relatively new territory in the ETF world. There aren't a lot of these hedge type exposures, but it's been around and very, I guess, at least accessible. Third and increasingly popular in a low yield world is selling derivatives, selling vol as a source of income. So covered call strategies, any sort of overriding strategies, costs as collars, things like that, right? Anything that sort of takes advantage of being able to sell vol for some other income or 
similar type of exposure. That's interesting. Our shortfall strategy takes the futures curve and rolls down the futures curve. So carry through that sort of exposure is an interesting one to think about as you think about commodities or VIX or fixed income. And I think that is sort of one place that we're going to play more in. And really, there isn't a lot of those type of exposures in the ETF vehicle other than basic commodity exposures. And the last and most controversial is always leverage. Ultimately, derivatives can be used for speculation or taking very aggressive bets. There's a balance. So if you're using it to gross up exposure in something like fixed income and create a risk parity portfolio, great, right? You could get behind that. If you're using it to take a 3x levered position on something because it moves a lot, I mean, that's when you're in, in the world where it can be more damaging than helpful. So that's sort of how I think about sort of the main use cases of derivatives inside the ETF. Are those listed or, because I know that you guys are among the small number of firms that are innovating in the ETF world that are also utilizing OTC derivatives within ETFs. So I think listed has a lot of advantages going for it. Certainly liquidity, the ability to price on an exchange, as well as some efficient tax benefits, like a 60-40 tax treatment. So that's great. Wherever we can find the listed way of doing something, I think that's the preferred way, generally speaking. The OTC market, however, for specific exposures like CDX or credit risk, interest rate derivatives, FX are much larger in the OTC world because that's where the largest corporations, central banks, institutions, hedge funds, asset managers, that world is very liquid and interesting. So there's, I think, a lot of innovation to be done. And you're right, we're one of the few and first ETF shops with an ISDA sort of in place with a number of these banks. And I think that's going to open up a capability toolkit, if you will. And we'll always sort of think first about listed versus OTC to create interesting solutions. So I think it's a fun sort of first mover advantage, fun in the sense that from an engineer's perspective, from an architect's perspective, it really opens up the realm of possibilities. Look, circle back to the short vol strategy. Yep. And what do we know about selling vol? Well, it works most of the time. We're all familiar with the pretty significant blowups. Of course, March of last year was one of them. GFC, you could throw Calips LTCM. Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about risk management. No one's going to lose money selling vol over a long, long period of time if you're properly sized. And that, of course, becomes the holy grail. And so implementation and structure becomes so critical. One of the favorite charts I've put out is if you actually graph both the XIV and let's say the VXX or the one that's slightly more levered from inception to now, they basically both went to zero just at different times and different speeds. Exactly. <laughs> so it's neither side's easy. So when you talked a little bit about yep. roll down and term structure, I'm curious when you, to the extent you can share, as you think sure. about extracting value from that relatively, I don't want to call it permanent, but it's pretty consistent. The amount of time we spend in contango is probably 80, 85% versus inversion. So we just have to avoid the other 15% or so. You're right. The sort of curve of the VIX right now, just playing between the first and second contract, it gives you an annualized carry potential somewhere around 150% right now, somewhere, give or take. It's big. It's triple digits. It doesn't always go that high, but given sort of all the uncertainty and demand for insurance, if you will, that VIX curve is very steep. And so what does that mean? Well, yeah, the carry trade, if you are to short that right now and nothing happens, you're going to do very well until it doesn't. So how do you take advantage of that? And you just touched on it. First is the appropriate sizing of that exposure. So is 100%, i.e. what XIV was doing back in the day, the appropriate amount of exposure? We think not. If you sort of back test different, just pure beta exposures, Somewhere in the 25-ish range is sort of the sweet spot. 50% is a heck of a lot better than 100 because you weren't vaporized in 2018. But 25% on a holding period basis is just better because you avoid situations like March that would have led to permanent loss of capital. And so you avoid those big steep drawdowns. But even that exposes you to a lot of risk. So we first 
grossed it down to 25% exposure where, again, better beta, generally speaking. And then this is our philosophy of capping sort of your downside or buying calls on the VIX. So out of the money calls, call it about 200% out of the money, relatively cheap, but it's funded out of the rewarding carry right now. And so you take a small fraction of your carry that you generate, you buy some calls on VIX, and now you've capped your loss. You also have sized your bet correctly or more efficiently, and you've still funded that whole thing out of this risk premium that's out there. And so that combination, a carry engine that's generating one of the most attractive risk premium out there with an anti-carry position that caps your losses, together creates a very, very interesting income generator, a yield generator. And that's what we're doing. It's sort of like looking across the various landscape for these type of opportunities, sizing it correctly, taking significant amount of sort of systematic back tests and scenario analysis and all sorts of things, and then marrying it with some hedge or long convexity position to sort of make a better combination. Yeah, I think the risk managed version of this exposure is just critical. It's getting it to be systematic and effectively what you're doing is providing a stop out in exactly. large measure. Is the exposure implemented, the base exposure, is it through VXX or is it through the futures kind of calendar spread itself? So the intent is to do it through futures directly ourselves. I think in the beginning, we're using a little bit of SVXY because it's out there. And as the fund grows, sort of the granularity of the futures contracts becomes less important. So fast forward a month from now, it'll be probably VIX futures. Today, it's a mix of VIX futures and or SVXY grossing it down. On the S&P side, you've got a product that I believe it's got both, it's got S&P exposure plus exposure on the tail in terms of hedging, but also to the upside as well. Yep. When people think about that in terms of the broad characteristics of that, again, you're buying a wide strangle, which again, certainly over the last year or so from a vol shortfall standpoint has cost a little bit. How do people, when they look at that product, how do they think about it and how does it do during a big market downturn? Well, it would do relatively well in a downturn because that's sort of anytime you have an extreme move, when you have a straddle position on, it's going to do better than the basic vanilla exposure. But step back, it's sort of that concept of carry and anti-carry again. So carry in this case is the equity premium. We're trying to back into the same reason that people allocate large chunks of their portfolio to U.S. large cap equities. It's a very reliable and historically attractive source of premia. So, hey, we're not going to mess up people's portfolio construction. Let's stay with the very well-known and popular beta, but let's build in some attractive overlay in the form of either an outright put out of the money. It's intended to design against very sharp, extreme events. Something along the line of March would have been a perfect scenario for any puts. But when you're buying five delta or less options, that portfolio is going to do very well in a sharp sell-off. But in today's world, that put also means you have a way to protect portfolios when fixed income is not doing that job, whether because it's no longer anti-correlated or because it's expensive as well. Puts may be relatively expensive, but fixed income is practically the most expensive it's ever been. And so the relative cost between fixed income and these direct hedges presents an attractive opportunity. Also on the call side, I mean, that insurance basically feels like not only is it free, it's paying you to take on that insurance from a skew perspective. There's so much supply from an overriding perspective that I think just the calls are by any historic measures looking pretty cheap. So anytime you could add a little convexity there, I think it at least increases the potential payoff, even in a hedge strategy. So that's sort of the thought process behind that is you're effectively long out of the money straddles, but the intention is to stay true to what that S&P allocation is. It's a one beta product that if the market significantly moves in either direction, that investment pays better. And if it sort of muddles in the middle or goes up or down, similar to the S&P, you lose a little bit in hedging costs. That combination creates a very interesting convex payoff. It is fascinating to look at the pricing of options across indices in the US. And then, of course, this 
almost bifurcated market of volatility where you've got the meme stocks experiencing this gigantic series of upshocks and prices. It used to be the case that if you were short an upside call and delta hedging it, that was a relatively harmless position. It was the put you had to worry about. And with yeah. these meme stock vol, it's just insane. But you're very right in the upside call and things like the S&P. Boy, they really give that one away. It's interesting. And I think a lot of people do have to worry about underperformance risk. And so I think that's a great placeholder to have in the portfolio. Let's talk about this really interesting development of which you guys are a part of in the OTC derivative realm. You touched on some of it, but you've got some real pioneers in the derivative space at Simplify working on product innovation, utilizing OTC derivatives. Give us the high level and we'll get into some of the details on it, but what you guys are hoping to do with utilizing OTC derivatives. Sure. So there's a lot of different ways to hedge a portfolio. Back in what the 80s, portfolio insurance was basically real-time hedging. Sort of like, hey, we'll move fast enough or we'll have an algorithm <laughs> to be able to time it when things go south. So that's at the extreme. The other extreme is just buy very long maturity options or contracts and don't worry about sort of timing it, have them in place. But usually those are either unavailable and or expensive. Whenever possible, if you get lock in a long-term insurance policy for cheap, it's probably going to be better, safer, and probably a lot less nervousness around sort of short-term moves or availability but the choice isn't usually there. And so the magic of our interest rate approach, which was really Harley Bassman's brain, he sort of brainstormed this thing for his own PA, but it was a way to hedge his interest rate exposure and his holdings inside of his portfolio. But he played on, one, the availability of long-term sort of calls on rates, i.e. people were willing to sell didn't believe rates could go up. And so the price of those calls were relatively cheap. It also is the cost of that call is benefiting from sort of a kink in the yield curve because there's a lot of issuers of those type of options right around the seven-year space or 10-year space. And so like the yield curve and the cost of those options has a flatness to it and then it kinks further down. So effectively, you're buying this really interesting way to hedge long-term interest rate moves, i.e. protect your portfolio from rising rates, where you're getting a long maturity seven-year option. So the path dependency when rates go up is removed. And it's the price of that insurance policy is cheaper than it should be because of supply and demand the dynamics of that sort of market. And so it's this really, really arguably underpriced and fairly liquid exposure to uh, interest rate hedge that is much more efficient than, for example, buying puts on TLT, which often don't go out further than a year or two and is hard to get, or shorting futures, which requires rolling and the path dependency there really matters, not to mention you're constantly having to roll that exposure. And so it becomes arguably one of the most efficient ways to do it, and it's heavily subsidized. So very interesting. So it's out there, but how the heck do you stick it inside of an ETF? First, you got to go sign up the banks that would allow you to sort of get that contract in place, which is not an easy task. Probably two or three ETF providers that come off the top of my head have those even in place out of 200 plus in the US. Secondly, you're going to have to have the staff to be able to trade those with the Goldman's and Morgan Stanley's of the world. These are not electronically trade or listed securities. So not on Robinhood? Heck no. Well, maybe <laughs> one day. But when you listen or read sort of the Bloomberg chats of how these things are traded, we joke about it. It does sound like a different language. Sort of like just the ability to trade and the talent to trade is another requisite. And then putting the infrastructure in place to be able to communicate and value these things so that it could be in an intraday traded ETF where a market maker like a Jane Street is on the other side pricing this. Those are all innovations. And we touched on it in the beginning, the ETF ecosystem. Here it is in motion to create this exposure through a supplier of that sort of exposure 
inside the ETF vehicle, a market maker able to play that other role and an asset manager that could package it inside of a listed ETF. And that's innovation in our world. And so the base exposure, this is some version of a payer swaption of it's some kind. It's a payer kind. swaption, yep. Very, what is it sitting on top of? Sitting on just basically some five-year treasury bonds, Okay. which by themselves aren't a meaningful driver inside the portfolio because you have so many long pair swaps in here. It's really a very interesting convex payoff. So if rates are flat or fall, the most you could lose the amount of money that you put into these premium, so call it 40, 50% of the ETF is your insurance. But if rates go up a couple hundred basis points, the value of those swaptions skyrockets and you're making four or five X type potential return on that same exposure. So it's a very asymmetric return profile. That's sort of a very efficient way to hedge something where you have very limited downside. You can't lose more than your swaptions, i.e. that you paid. And then you have this very asymmetric and convex payoff that if rates go up, in theory, if it goes up significantly, it's almost like this uncapped return on the other side. Take us through the, I'll use the word redemption process. Mm -hmm. So someone owns this ETF and wants to unwind it. And of course, the end user owns some version of a payer swap option that needs, yep. let's just say the unwind is big enough. The Greeks and the risk exposure needs to be unwound. Take us through the sequence sure. of events that occurs there. So let's say half the ETF gets redeemed out. So let's start, just make up a number. It's a $100 million ETF and $50 million comes out. Well, what we would do in that case would be to sell a prorata slice of the portfolio, i.e. half the treasury bond position. That's very easy. And the remaining half of those swaption positions would need to be unwound. So you would contact your list of counterparties, the big banks that are signed up, and you would basically ask for the unwind of these swaption positions. You get the other side. When you execute across the different counterparties, that dollar equivalent exposure you're done. They basically say you're done with the trade and the long and short side of the payer swaptions offset and you're back down. So it could be done in a day. It could be done across a number of counterparties. Again, very liquid, very multi-counterparty part of the world where tens of billions of dollars are transacted every hour, every day. It's really an easy sort of part to get deep liquidity but it happens to be OTC. So again, you need the infrastructure and people in place to be able to participate in that world. I think it's really critical that folks have access to these what-if trades because we do live in relatively unprecedented times yep. when it comes to monetary and fiscal policy and the price of risk and the potential backdrop of inflation. It's excellent. And I'm sure that's something that the end user is going to find a way to find some value in. I'm curious, in terms of the other sources of inquiry or the demand that you're seeing out there from the end user base, from a product development standpoint, yep. where are you guys spending time in terms of thinking about how to solve the problems of the present sure. day investor? So it's probably the same problems that the largest asset managers are all getting, but we could address them in a different way. So the classic problems, Income. How do we generate income in a low yield world? So we're solving for those type of things. Non-correlated asset classes. So while a fixed income isn't going to be my anti-correlated exposure, where can I go? It's now alternatives or hedges and things like that. Again, we could solve for that using options and or alternative exposures. And we're getting a lot of questions on inflation. And so we're anticipating launching a couple of products around commodities and gold, and we have one that has some Bitcoin exposure in there. So different scenarios where these type of asset classes and or exposures can be very attractive and they're sort of back in vogue again, even though the last couple of weeks, certainly that fear has diminished a little bit. I don't think the long-term fear and especially the demand for those type of exposures has really come down. And so we're getting a lot of inquiries there. Just really those main problems, overvalued, overheated equities. How do I protect that income? Where do I generate income that I can basically fund my retirement out of? And then sort of protecting portfolios against these crazy, unpredictable risks like inflation, like fiat debasement, like geopolitics. They're universal problems and we're just solving it in a slightly different way. I think the search for diversifying assets has always been 
on the top of people's minds, but now probably more so than ever, especially given what could be the end of the line, perhaps on the rate side in terms of its magical positive carry hedge (laughs) that it's done for quite some time. You talked a little bit about crypto. And so there's plenty of conversation, at least in the markets, about the applications for crypto ETFs. Tell us what you see there and how you see that evolving. Like any asset class, I think a lot of the value of something is if enough people say it has value. And so when you have, it feels like a big chunk of an entire generation or two, as well as I've heard anecdotes of about 20% of the most competitive like schools engineers are entering the digital assets slash crypto space. When you have that kind of human driver of value, I think you basically have an established asset class. And so first, if it's an established asset class, is it interesting in different ways? I think it is. I think you have the really deep sort of digital gold bunker approach. Yeah, it's definitely got value in that. Or if you're in a international situation where a government is unstable and you need sort of a store of value, certainly use cases around that. But increasingly, you're creating use cases for things from micropayments to apps to just, again, very liquid store of values. DeFi is creating some interesting plays. So broadly speaking, I think it is a real asset class. I think it's uncorrelated enough and interesting enough to think about. And even as a passive skeptic, I think the exposure, if it's a $2 trillion exposure, it's about 1% or a little less of the global investable asset classes out there. So a 1% or 2% exposure feels like a reasonable what if. And really that's sort of what we're trying to address in our product. It's a 10% allocation to Bitcoin via Grayscale, because that's the only permitted exposure right now. And then 100% exposure to S&P, because we want to be able to fund that exposure. You fund it by saying, hey, if you have S&P 500 exposure and you want a little bit of Bitcoin, take a dollar out of your S&P exposure, put this in there. You still have your S&P and you get a little bit of Bitcoin via Grayscale as your what if hedge. I'm really excited about the development of the options market on Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's very nascent. It's early days. Yeah. It's not spy options, <laughs> but it's got enough. And I think you make a great point, which is it's very clear that the amount of brain power that's developed here is significant. And the asset class has got some really interesting characteristics. You pointed to one of them. It's not a necessarily a risk-off asset, but it certainly isn't really correlated to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And that derivatives market seems like it's got legs and there's, I think, going to be a lot of financial engineering in coming years around, certainly around Bitcoin and probably some of the slightly smaller ones as well. We've talked about, well, we talked a little bit about Bitcoin. We talked a little bit about XIV. And I just think product innovation is just such an important part of what makes finance interesting and valuable. But sometimes it does come at a cost. We saw the XIV and the retail component of it get caught up in really not understanding the riskiness of this as it went up and up in 2017. What is in your rendering the right balance of striking the right balance between giving entrepreneurs and innovative firms like Simplify and your competitors the ability to create new products, but also knowing that in the wrong hands, folks can get hurt. That's happened before. How should we think about that balance? And I think that word is balanced. So you don't want to stifle all innovation and sort of create sort of a complacent world. You want to create that opportunity, but then you don't want a complete wild, wild west where we're repeating all of the sort of lessons of the original finance back in the bucket shop era and things like that, or even earlier. So what's the balance? In the ETF world, I think the pendulum actually has been swinging away from the merit-based regulatory framework. You're allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do this. And it's only recently started swinging back towards the disclosure-based, more free market type of approach. I don't think it's gone too far past sort of a balanced spot yet. From my perspective, yes, we point to things like XIV, but look, it's a 2018 event. It happened once and it wasn't this main sort of event. It was really something that was niche and something that was identified early by a lot of market observers, including, again, Michael Green and Chris Cole. So I'd say on balance, it feels like the ETF world has got 
enough innovation to make it interesting and fast growing, but hasn't crossed too far across that balance point of view. And I think as long as disclosure is tied to accountability, where bad players, bad products are punished, either through delistings, potentially even fines or penalties, I think that's okay. I think we can introduce sort of a stick and carrot sort of approach, but I think you don't want to stifle that pendulum from straying too far from that disclosure-based framework. I think as you go into the wild, wild west on the digital asset and DeFi side, I think regulation is inevitable. You're seeing it already. So I think that pendulum is already starting to swing back as everything from the IRS to central banks start taking a look at that sort of world. I think it is going to get regulated. I think it'd be great if it were regulated because then all of a sudden it becomes eligible for things like the ETF and listed options. And it becomes much more interesting for for the main financial system, perhaps not interesting for people who've truly been on that cusp of innovation on the crypto side, but there's a balance there and regulation is inevitable and probably good for the overall system. And then just as we close the conversation and thanks very much for your time. What are you most excited about as you look out three to five years in terms of business growth and opportunities? What gets you most excited? Some of the best video games out there are sort of like open sandbox, sort of like you get to go create your own adventure. And I feel like Simplify does feel like that for me and I hope for most of our team. It's an open sandbox because we're solving these big epic problems that we talked about. And we have this really compelling and almost unique toolkit in terms of listed and OTC options and frankly, just the mindset of innovation because we don't have a existing fixed income or alts business that we're disrupting or cannibalizing. So that sort of open sandbox view is to me the best part of my job. And I think that is what is attracting some of the talent that we are attracting because they recognize the opportunity from all the secular trends headed towards that, again, vol space options and the use of derivatives broadly, but also the massive macro tailwind of needing something other than what's already out there. I think it just creates this really unique time. We're still small. I look at that ETF league table of 200 plus names and we're somewhere in the 70s, which is great that we've only been around since September, but it's a long way to go and a lot of places to climb, but it feels great. We're moving in the right direction and it's fun. Excellent. Well, we'll leave it there. And again, thanks, Paul. It was great to catch up and thanks for your time. This was fun. Thanks, Dean. Same. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, Your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time. (laughs) 